Modern research in the field of hypnotism began with the researches of Anton Mesmer in the 18th century. While these researches in many ways produced positive results, they were open to criticism and suspicion, perhaps <coughs> at least in part because of the rather flamboyant way in which Mesmer uh, practiced the art and the peculiarly bombastic style in which he wrote on the subject. Even a progressive man, philosopher and scholar, Benjamin Franklin, after examining and attending some of Metzmar's seances, declined to affirm his belief in the validity of the phenomenon. Scientific bodies were particularly unhappy about the whole subject. But it must be admitted that enough doctors and scientists became interested to cause a heavy controversy which locked the subject for nearly 75 years. It was in the middle of the 19th century that an English physician began to experiment with the theories of Mesmer and applied them cautiously but successfully to a number of cases that came under his personal care. He changed the name from Mesmerism to Hypnotism and again brought down the wrath of the gods. In this case, the gods consisted not only of scientific bodies, but of religious groups and public opinion itself. It is quite probable that public opinion was rather heavily influenced by certain clergymen who thundered against hypnotism from their pulpit in the same way that they had also thundered against anesthesia. The popular mind, however, came to regard hypnotic techniques as a kind of magic. It involved all of the romantic overtones that have been preserved to us in the story of Sandali. The hypnotist was a satanic person, weird, strange, and actually a sorcerer out of the literature of the Middle Ages. His methods, being poorly understood, were richly misunderstood. And the popular mind came to the conclusion that a visit to a hypnotist was very much like a pact with Satan. In some way, this system of treatment interfered with the normal function of the human soul. It was a dastardly contrivance, giving to the operator tremendous power and control over the life of every innocent trilby that came along. This attitude was not improved by the rise in the 19th century of stage hypnotism in which the entire field fell into the lap of entertainment. This meant every possible means of exploiting and dramatizing the subject with little regard for its dignity or its basic meaning. Gradually, however, interest in the fact revealed through the technique of hypnotism increased and probably 
develop most rapidly after the rise of our interest in the psychological life of the individual. When we began to study the internal subjective functions of the human mind, it opened the door for the further estimation of the basic problem of hypnosis. First of all, there was much rubbish to be cleared away. Much of this rubbish, of course, had no more sound foundation than public opinion. But there was also a tie with antiquity that proved rather embarrassing to scientific men who do not like to be regarded as the direct descendants of witch doctors. They feel this is somewhat uh, a compromising of their dignity. We know that hypnosis in various forms and under various names was broadly practiced among ancient people, particularly among primitive people. It had a place in the therapy of Greece and Rome and Egypt. But in our living experience, we found a close tie with certain Bhutan practices of the West Indies and the mysterious remedies of the American Indian medicine man. Such affini affinities and affiliations were not particularly intriguing uh, to the American Medical Association. We sort of felt that it should be regarded as having outgrown such old beliefs. In time, however, private practitioners stepped into the field. They began to contemplate the matter much as Paracelsus had done, with a new dedication namely a dedication to the need of the sick. But this should come before all prejudice, and we should decline or reject nothing which could be actually useful. Because of the prevailing popular prejudice, one of the earliest types of investigation in the modern field of hypnotism was to determine whether there was any truth in the idea that some mysterious fluid, essence, energy, substance, passed from the hypnotist to the subject. Was there some strange bond set up by means of which the completeness of personal integration was injured? Did the hypnotist, so to say, uh, put some part of himself into his subject, where it remains to affect freedom of thought, or freedom of action, or independent psychological existence. All research to the present time has indicated that this is not true, that there is no uh, connection established between the hypnotist any subject, other than that which is evident and obvious in the phenomena itself, that there is a temporary influence cannot be denied, but that this influence is other than psychological is now not only denied but rather clearly disproved. Many ways can be used to check such things. And all checking has as yet proved negative. There seems to be no need for the assumption that hypnosis involves metaphysical elements. It is purely a physical matter, but one which involves elements of our physical nature, which have only been known to us within a comparatively recent period. Once the public has come to recognize that the hypnotist is a physician and not a magician, 
much good can be accomplished. An individual with numerous difficulties can hope for help in this direction. Now we know that religious authority is very powerful in our thinking. No one wishes to discount the importance of religious belief. There are religious groups today that are strongly opposed to all hypnotic research. They do not even wish that the subject uh, should be explored. Certainly their members, if they wish to be in good standing, must follow the leadership of the faith to which they belong. But as no faith or no sect dominates public opinion in this country according to the definite provision of the First Amendment to the Constitution and the first section of the Bill of Rights, those of other beliefs not holding this antagonism towards hypnosis have a perfect right also to explore their own convictions and make such discoveries as they feel may be of common benefit. As in the case of anesthesia, the benefits are now becoming so obvious that old opinions are being forced uh, to change. And in most instances, such changes increase public comfort and safety. Hypnosis as a field began in a comparatively simple area, namely the possibility of communicating certain attitudes, certain instructions, certain suggestions from one person to another in a manner more favorable than homely advice or old-fashioned admonition. As the time passed, however, it became evident that the whole concept of hypnosis rested upon a pattern of universal laws. That these laws not only invited one use, but opened a broad field of research, a field capable of making a variety of contributions at different times and under different circumstances. Thus, the concept, the basic hypothesis underlying the fact of hypnosis gives us many inducements to explore neglected areas of mental phenomena. There is even a, a suggestion, a hope, that out of the byproduct of hypnotic research, there may come an entirely new concept of therapy, a concept that which will not involve hypnosis as we know it today, or at least only in small parts but which will drive home to us one of the most important truths in the entire world of therapy, namely the possibility that man can become his own physician, that the individual possesses means for restoring health on many levels by the use of energies resting within himself, rather than by the use of comparatively violent medications and drugs. So if hypnosis leads us into a field of drugless therapy, we may do the body a great favor. For under our present system, we must first use the drug to get over the malady, and then we must use every resource of the body and mind to get over the drugs. 
Consequently, we fight death with a kind of death. And we are not always sure which kind is going to win. In this case also, we come to certain truths or principles which we must explore. And as is so often the case in all fields, and this is not unique to our present subject, the primary facts, the essential principles, are as yet elusive. We have only secondary facts. We have only observed or recorded knowledge. But the very core of the subject, the very nature of the hypnotic influence itself, though approximated, cannot be fully defined. We know that the principal problem is to discover as possible how the human system reacts to suggestions and to what degree it can react and in what department of structure or function the effect of hypnosis uh, can be uh, seen or noted. What is the hypnotic state as we understand it today? Some have said that it is an artificial somnambulism, that the individual can be put to sleep in many ways by a narcotic, by an hypnotic drug, by hypnotic suggestion, and by just plain boredom. Up to the present time, however, we have not been able to standardize the therapy of boredom. But we have been able to observe that certain drugs will produce forms of hypnosis. This is one of the points that reminds us uh, that it is not the result of the mental attitude of an individual. We also realize that phenomenalism is a form of sleep and is usually an artificially induced trance-like sleep condition. Phenomenalism, however, is found without hypnosis. And there is a considerable structure of knowledge bearing upon natural and automatic phenomenalism. Phenomenalism as an artificial or induced form of sleep suggests that in some way it derives itself from the natural form of sleep. The principal factors in sleep as we know them today are fatigue and the rapid increase of toxin in the body due to the breakdown of structure under activity. The individual goes to sleep for several reasons one of which is that he is tired. Hypnosis originally works upon the hypothesis uh, that the operator induced an artificial fatigue. And it was found that this fatigue could be most easily and quickly induced by fatiguing the optical structure. The individual under eye strain fatigues rapidly. Also under eye strain, particularly when this strain is scientifically induced, there came a kind of disorientation which increased fatigue and caused the person to seek its escape in sleep exhaustion. The second possibility that has been brought to our attention is that hypnosis is closely associated with the phenomenon of hysteria. We know that hysteria, as it is 
studied psychologically has very little in common with what we call an, an hysterical outburst. In the 19th century, it was proper, in fact, practically required, that ladies become hysterical under all critical situations. Since that time, however, better solutions have been discovered both for and by the ladies. Hysteria is actually almost a paralyzing experience. It causes the individual frequently to lose consciousness. Under some kind of excitement, pain, fear, particularly psychic fear and psychic pain. Hysteria was an excitement, an almost instantaneous nervous breakdown, which because of the damage was comparatively negligible, enjoyed a rapid recovery, usually in a few moments with the aid of a little ammonia or smelling salt. It is conceivable that fear, as we knew it in the 19th century, particularly fear of the unknown, which involves the hypnotic concept, caused individuals to become disoriented in the presence of hypnosis, and therefore subject to a kind of hysteria or a blacking out of their normal conscious function. This concept had some merit, but now we go perhaps even further. We know now, for example, that sleep is not what we always thought it to be. There is more than one cause of sleep. In fact, there are more than the several causes we once recognized. We now know that a very powerful factor in sleep is habit. By placing persons in caves under the earth, where it was not possible to, for light to reach them, we made them servants of their own watches and clocks, which was a very interesting experience, especially if these timepieces were scientifically, uh, shall we say, tampered with. A clock could be placed where a number of persons could see it. A clock so arranged in its mechanism that it recorded 60 minutes on the face in a period of only 30 minutes of actual time. It was found that the persons involved slept according to the clock and not according to true time. It was found, therefore, that if the clock was sufficiently slowed, the person might not feel any unusual fatigue or need of sleep for 20 or 30 hours. But if the uh, clock was made very rapid, he might con consider himself as having finished his day's work and be completely exhausted in three hours, even though in all the procedure, the nature of his residence, a cave under the earth, was certainly not inclined to create physical fatigue. So these facts became rather evident that the clock became an hypnotic agent. The clock told him when to go to sleep. Whiff, he was asleep just as surely as though he had been handed an adequate amount of chloroform. Therefore, habit also indicates how strongly we can influence ourselves. Actually, the clock, regardless of the time on the face of it, could have very little effect upon us 
if it did not set up within ourselves a series of association mechanisms. We fooled ourselves the meaning of the time on the clock, regardless of the truth involved. When the clock said eight o'clock in the morning, we were hungry for breakfast, even though the true time might be 11 o'clock at night. When the clock said noon, we began to look for lunch. And because it is almost impossible for individuals to measure time adequately, experiments were made which proved that the individual could develop a healthy appetite between breakfast and lunch in 45 minutes. <laughs> also, that he could have no appetite at all uh, between uh, lunch and dinner, in the ordinary sense of the word, because the clock was wrong. Therefore, he was not uncomfortable if there was a 12-hour interval between meals. The clock regulated his life. It regulates most of us in one way or another. The clock, however, merely suggested something continuously. Suggested traditional habits, ways of doing things. And the rest of the job we did for ourselves. If we had not been able to read the clock, we probably would have sort of relaxed and might have come into a common rhythm of our own. The pattern of our own nature might have come through, and we could return almost to an animal state in which the animal eats when it's hungry, and sleeps when it's tired, because it cannot read the clock, a blessed state for the animal. From this series of researches, several very important points were demonstrated. First, naturally, that we suggest habits to ourselves. We use certain subconscious patterns. We live by them. And our entire the pattern of expectancy is dominated. Also, that these expectancies in ourselves produce a series of psychophysical reactions. Hunger is not of itself completely a psychic thing, although it may be influenced thereby. Normal hunger arises from normal needs but it can be artificially distorted so that it can occur more rapidly or less rapidly than habit. This may be due to our, our old kinship with the original uh, pre-Adamite man because primitive man, like the animal, probably nibbled as often as possible, eating not much of a time, but frequently. And the entire regulation of nutrition, sleep, exercise, came to man as a result of purposes of his own, artificial situations that he himself set up. Working hours depended upon regularity. Man gradually set up rules to govern fatigue, hunger, and many other habits. These rules also ultimately became a part of his subconscious life. When, however, his conscious life is disordered in any way, the old rules which never really changed, the rules which were before man's self-consciousness, simply assert themselves once more. Thus man has a certain capacity to perform any function at almost any time. It is only specialization that has determined the time in terms of clock or sundial or hourglass. 
The next point that comes from this particular situation is to consider to what degree man has the power of suggesting to himself and how far such suggestions can be carried for woe or weal. As suggestion is actually a more or less voluntary process, and we cannot accept or respond to a suggestion that violates the energy sources which make suggestion possible, it follows that the average person, unless he is under abnormal stress or under some psychotic pressure, will seldom, if ever, suggest to himself or vitalize the suggestions of others that are contrary to conscience and morality. He will only suggest that which is acceptable to some pattern within his own nature. Within this pattern, however, there are numerous degrees of possibility. We know that the simplest of these suggestions in hypnosis, sleeping and waking, is only a beginning. The suggestion has already been demonstrated to have a number of possible uh, applications and specializations. We know, for example, that the individual, by suggestion, can block pain reflexes. That he is therefore able, at will, to remove sensation from areas of the body. Now this blocking becomes a very interesting thing because it was originally assumed that this blockage originated in an area of the brain, that hypnosis produced a certain disassociation within brain areas, much as they become disassociated in natural sleep. This theory, however, must depend for its validity upon the concept that the brain is a highly complicated instrument composed of so many key areas uh, that various small locational parts uh, can be anesthetized without interfering with the major body of the structure. Now, for example, we do not have to anesthetize along a nerve, which would be the common concept. The belief, for example, that as we may put Novocaine into uh, some branch of the trifacial nerve, thereby blocking one side of the face. We uh, bring our automatic or hypnotic into some area of the brain and block, perhaps, the nerve reflex in the arm or cause it to deaden or lose sense of fear. Or we may block a large area, as in the case of the use of hypnosis in obstetrics. But here is the thing that makes it all very peculiar we can block the last joint of one finger. We can leave the other joint wide awake, the whole hand wide awake, and the whole arm wide awake. To achieve this peculiar result, and there are many ways in which we can prove this, it will probably be necessary for us to reform some of our notions as to the mechanics of the hypnotic process. In optics, for example, we can block a form, a pattern, or a color. 
we can take a large room with a hundred persons in it, and under hypnotic suggestion, we can plot the subject's ability to see one of those persons, but continue to see the other ninety-nine. The one person that he cannot see can wander all about the room, standing in front of the other ninety-nine, one at a time and in any accidental order. The subject will continue to see the person behind the one he cannot see, but will not be able to see the person that is blocked out. The room is not blocked. The power to see is not blocked. The power to remember fully and completely every occurrence in the room is not blocked. There is no damage to memory, consciousness, awareness, or general vision. There is simply one person distinguished as a person who simply remains invisible. The same consideration comes in the problem of taste reflexes. We can cause an individual to enjoy food with all of its most delicate flavors and can completely block out the taste of onions. We can dose everything the individual is eating with onions. And we may have previously learned that onion is one thing he cannot eat or which distresses him profoundly. Yet he will eat and enjoy all flavors, and swear there was no onion in the food. We can hand him the onion, and by blocking his visible sense of the onion and his taste sense, we can let him eat the onion, and he will be convinced that it is an orange, a pear, or a cucumber. Yet no other part of his mentality is interfered with. On a still more interesting psychological level, we can also cause him to project from himself as visible phenomena, conditions which have no existence, to return to this hundred room. Of uh, these hundred persons in a room. A person can be caused to be visualized in that room who is not there, can be seen as clearly and easily as any person who is there. The subject who has visualized this person who does not exist can go up to him and shake hands with him with no sense that the handshake is not with another person as solid as himself. Thus we can also project from the individual a whole series of non-existing circumstances. The old theatrical performance of causing the person to believe that he is walking across a river when he is only passing over the living room rug is probably remembered by many of us. How carefully this person will remove his shoes and stockings and wade painfully across the old Persian carpet. He sees the water. He knows it is there. He feels that it is wet and cold. And yet, there isn't any. Go on into other fields of possible suggestion. And remembering always that the only way that the person can receive this suggestion or visualize it is by a kind of personal acceptance of it. We also begin to ask questions that probably will become more important 20 years from now. 
and that is where does this process of self-suggestion begin and end? How much of what we believe to be here now exists only because of our own believing? What part of the universe is the projection of our own general acceptance. What effect does this acceptance have upon our culture, our concepts of values, our appreciations of art, our dedications to various pursuits, our recognition of the excellence of various subjects, to what degree are all these acceptances merely dramatized by our own uh, intensity? Is this not merely the extension of the fact that man creates his own psychic life and therefore can project this psychic life upon the things that are occurring around him? Is this one of the basic causes of prejudice? Is prejudice an hypnotic power by which we literally blind ourselves to fact? Is prejudice a self-deceit so real that it can make us see water on the living room rug, take hands with people who do not exist, or try to sit down in what appears to be an empty chair in which someone else is already sitting. Where can we say that the power to suggest to ourselves begins and leaves off? Our hope in this, of, you know, not being too greatly deceived, is that we associate this suggestion with another person that we will not respond unless another person whose authority we accept makes the suggestion. Yet we know that the same suggestion can be made with a phonograph record. That it is per perfectly possible for a hypnotist on a television program to put part of the visual audience asleep. You can be 500 miles away watching your own set, and you may succumb to his suggestion. What other suggestions do we knowingly or unknowingly accept? What is the phenomenon of the dictator, of the political policy? What is advertising? These things may all be suggestion pressures causing us to lose a large part of our own orientation. The study of suggestion may lead ultimately to a realization of how we deceive ourselves and also really relieve us of the opinion of our friends that we are merely doing things badly because we are unpleasant people. Perhaps we are not unpleasant at all. Perhaps we believe what we are doing, and to us it is just as real as it is unreal to someone else. This, of course, can lead to quite an area of speculation. We know psychologically that there must be some valid association between the subject and the hypnotist. But this association is one of psychological acceptance. The hypnotist does not force himself upon us. We force him upon ourselves. We suspect him of ability and conversely suspect that we cannot resist them. We also work by contrary. For in some instances, we insist that we are not susceptible. 
and insist that we cannot be so influenced. But in such cases, we usually protest too much. And often, this is only a, an effort to hide our own fear that we can be influenced. Therefore, we cannot depend too much upon the idea that only susceptible people, not ourselves, can be influenced. The pattern of being influenced by something or someone is archetypal in all of us. So we merely let the patterns have their own way. Psychologically, what is the basis of our receptivity to the peculiar suggestion of a hypnotist? Probably, as in the discussion of last week, the primary agent is acceptance. We believe this person can do this thing. We suspect if we are there for therapeutic of character help, that we are going to be assisted. We have certain confidence in the validity of the truth. We also have certain nervousness certain uneasiness, which of course makes us even more susceptible. We also may resist to a degree, which will cause the reaction of hysteric tension and we will also succumb, but the slightly different method, which also points out that there is more than one method. There are probably hundreds of methods by which various types of hypnosis can be induced. And we are not sure that these different methods all produce the same type of hypnosis. We have not yet broken this point down as adequately as will ultimately be done. If we do not resist the gift, if we accept the thought has been advanced that the hypnotist begins to become a symbol of certain psychic integrations in ourselves. For instance, the hypnotist can become the parental image. It can become, he can become the symbol of any and all dominance which we have experienced during life. As the small child places great confidence in the parental wisdom until he is undeceived, the adult always wishes or desires to come under strong leadership, leadership in which he has faith and confidence. Once a rapport is established, it is quite possible that the hypnotist takes the place of the parent image. And just as surely as the parent image in man can hypnotize him continuously, so now we have a transference of the parent image from the subjective to the objective. We have the person, the operator, as parent. And we find ourselves again as child submitting to authority. This line of thinking may ultimately uh, lead in a number of profitable directions. Because it is a key or a clue, perhaps, to the entire nature of the parent image in man. How this image can be conditioned, directed, and to a measure, if necessary, neutralized by the introduction of suggestion. Most persons today are carrying heavy psychological loads. They are in conflict inside of themselves. We now attempt to help these persons by giving them certain 
psychological ventilation. We try to bring them out of themselves. We try by various means to bring their problems to their own attention. Yet even with the best of intentions, we can get into trouble. We can release more in a patient than he can handle. Or we can release elements which are not relevant to an immediate situation and may even work against it. When trying to help a person to escape from domination, we may bring him into too aggressive a state of aggression. He may have listened to everyone, but under a revulsion may in turn listen to no one. This is not a desirable situation. It is merely tossing the center of consciousness from one extreme to another. Hypnosis, however, by enabling us to explore more deeply, and by enabling us to do this without the conscious interference of the patient, can often assist us to truly evaluate. This evaluation may not in the end be different from that which will be discovered by the normal means of analysis. We may come to the same conclusion, and if both methods are correct, we must come to approximately the same conclusion. But under hypnotic technique, we can come to that conclusion perhaps 10, 20, or 50 hours sooner than by the analytical method. We can immediately uh, break through the defenses by means of which the subject or the patient is subconsciously attempting to deceive the counselor who is trying to help him. This type of secret deceit is very, very common in most uh, fields of psychology. We have already mentioned the problem of consciousness. And this is another area which may be opened up by hypnotic research. And many new discoveries may be made concerning the nature of consciousness. Some of these discoveries, going back to opinions held long ago, but in the meantime rejected, because there was no adequate means to check them, and they did not fit into the gradually evolving structure of present attitudes and ideas. One of these points has to do with the location of consciousness in relationship to the body. Now, we're not going into a metaphysical discussion of this, but rather the relationship of consciousness in what might be termed the nervous field of man's physical and corporeal structure. Is consciousness actually located in an area? Is consciousness primarily located in the brain? Does it arise, as some have held, as a reaction to certain brain stimuli? Or is it the source of these very stimuli themselves? Does consciousness, as some mystics have held, reside primarily in the human heart? Or, as is now beginning to be more suspected as a result of hypnotic research, is consciousness diffused through every cell of structure? Is, therefore, consciousness a diffusion, as Buddha thought it was? Is consciousness something that life salt and pepper is scattered everywhere through the structure, seasoning it all, 
and giving it all life. His consciousness is resident with life in structure. Then what we call objective consciousness is some aggregate of conscious factors, a plexus or ganglia of nervous or conscious elements brought together to create an area of intensivity more coordinated. And thus this intensified area then in turn reacts upon the less intensified area to serve as a control mechanism. In other words, do we gather up areas of consciousness and make them directed over non-organized areas? If such is the case, how do we do it? Is this consciousness actually under the control of the mind? Is it free of the mind? Or is the mind itself merely an expression of it? We used to think that it was under the control of the mind. This we are beginning to doubt. We used to think uh, that it originated in the mind and I it was identical with it. This also we are beginning to doubt. And our present tendency is to suspect that consciousness includes the mind and that the mind is a kind of focal point set up for the distribution of consciousness through structures having organized mental neural structure or nature. This brings then the possibility that mind is a kind of director of consciousness on the objective side of life. That by means of mind, consciousness is distributed through the mental, emotional, physical structure. This would be more or less harmonious with the present findings in hypnosis. For hypnosis now appears to indicate that the mind governs the distribution of consciousness or energy or the life element itself and that this mental direction can have a series of very important consequences. We know that it can any part of the body which you so desire. The moment the concentration is removed, the symbol dies out. This actually must mean, therefore, that we are in direct control of the body at all times and probably almost all of its processes, the only possible exception being the actual uh, function of the heart. This we can influence, but it is not certain whether we can completely control it. If this thinking be logical. We have at our disposal certain immediate therapeutic uses of suggestion once the formulas, techniques, and methodology are clearly developed. We have the power through concentration or through a kind of hypnotic intensification of self-suggestion, we have the power to break up blockages in circulation. We have the power to restore impaired function if it has not gone too far. We have the power uh, to hasten elimination of toxins from various areas of the body. We have a power to create so rapid a circulation that we can prevent blood poisoning. 
we also have the power to block circulation to the degree that we can prevent uh, some dangerous element from circulating quickly throughout the system. We have power to hasten the rapidity of cure for various ailments, including broken bones. We have the power uh, to adjust ourselves to changes of temperature, uh, to uh, various pressures, to intensify physical strength within a reasonable degree. This we realize the moment we recognize also that in cases of certain mental disease, the strength of a comparatively healthy person, a comparatively weak person, suddenly becomes excessive. And a person who in normal life has practically no strength may require several persons to restrain them if once the mental equilibrium is lost. This also means that this additional, is stre additional strength is always available without mental unbalance. So out of the study of this different type of research, we realize that it is possible to combat fatigue, that it is possible uh, to hasten many processes and thus accomplish a more rapid recovery from sickness. All of these points, of course, leave us on the horns of another dilemma. Suggestion is only about as important as the intelligence of the suggesting power whatever it may be. If the operator, in the case of hypnosis, makes a wrong suggestion which is still not contrary to some innate reservation on the part of the subject, the result may not be good. The individual believing that he knows what he wants or he needs trying to suggest to himself may only block necessary symptoms and hide from himself ailments which might, through neglect, become serious or even mortal. Therefore, suggestion, like the aspirin tablet, is dangerous in the hands of the person who uses it without judgment or excessively. Things that help wisely use, hinder if unwisely used. We need, therefore, a very clear vision of structure and function in order to know how it should be influenced to produce the necessary and proper results. Here is a whole world that has not been touched. We are perfectly content to assume that the suggestion is right if it achieves the end that we immediately recognize to be necessary. But nature has a very involved way of working. And nearly always, trouble is nature's effort to remedy a greater trouble. Thus, if we block nature's means, for example, of disposing of poison in the system, or if we cause it to be eliminated more rapidly than nature intended, we may get into further trouble. Thus, the accurate knowledge of nature's own way is, is essential to the best use of suggestion in all of its fields. Without this use, uh, there are many sad consequences. The use of hypnosis as a means of psychotherapy also presents a wide new world of special possibilities. Certain ailments traditionally resist hypnotic uh, treatment. 
These ailments are for the most part ailments which do not arise within the area of the therapy or against which the therapy is incorrectly directed. For example, take alcoholism. A person seeking hypnotic help for this ailment is likely to ask that the desire for alcohol be blocked on the assumption that if it is blocked, that the habit will be broken. Actually, this is not usually true. Under some conditions, alcoholism is successfully treated by suggestion. But as in all forms of medicine and in all forms of therapy, the results are not standardized. That is why we actually refer to medicine as an art rather than a science is because we are not able to standardize the results of treatment. We have a wide explanation for this, developing primarily from the utter individuality of the construction of each individual. We are all different. Therefore, because of innumerable factors of difference, we will not react in the same way uh, to various medications. There is more to it than difference. And the case of the use of hypnosis for alcohol or alcoholism is a point. Alcoholism is itself only a symptom. Very few persons actually drink because they enjoy the taste of alcohol. They do so because, perhaps, of social pressure, but to become truly alcoholic because of psychic pressure. This psychic pressure means that there is something within the psychic compound itself uh, which is out of order, which is not adequately sustaining the integrity of the individual. He is suffering from psychic stress. He is suffering from worry, from fear, uh, from perpetual adolescence, from any one of a number of ailments. And the alcoholism is merely the breakthrough of these symptoms. Therefore, to use hypnosis to correct it by directing the hypnotic suggestion in the form of, I do not want al alcohol, may be saying no more than the individual himself has already said to himself a thousand times. The blocking of this outlet is possible temporarily, but very temporarily because the pressure behind has not been touched. The real situation has not been reached. Hypnosis, then, as merely a sedation of some kind, as merely a temporary liberation from a group of symptoms that supplies only a very small part of its contribution. The larger contribution lies in the digging in uh, to the various elements of the situation. Let us take the first series, series of possible examples. Under hypnotic uh, pressure or under hypnotic influence, children have been taught to read and write who were otherwise very slow in this ability or these abilities. The child has been assisted uh, to keep up with its studies. Spelling has been improved. Memory has been improved. Coordination has been helped. And the ability to, we'll say, arrange patterns of study has been stimulated. Has been stimulated. Thus we see 
that hypnosis can suggest things to do that need doing. If the person does these things, he himself naturally benefits from the doing. Here we have a kind of habit mechanism which can have considerable results. Although, again, we may have to search behind to find out why the child is slow of learning. Sometimes it is poor instruction. Sometimes it is comparative indifference to the subject. Oftentimes it is psychic stress. All of these elements can be weighed and examined. And by so doing, the facts can become known and worked with. In psychoanalysis, a great problem arises in the isolation of the true cause of a very serious neurotic pressure, frustration, or tension. Usually, the individual has gone through either one intense stress pattern or a series of less intense ones which work together to set up a mechanism in that area. Very often, this stress pattern and the circumstance are not consciously remembered. Therefore, we have the outlet of dreams. Dreams have a certain relationship to psychic uh, or to hypnotic procedure. Just as the hypnotized person is not merely allowed to sleep, but is subjected to certain conditioning so that he is able to serve himself during sleep or to unfold certain aspects of his nature while unconscious of what he is doing. So in a measure, dreams are a reversal of this procedure. For in dreams, interior pressures push forward into the objective. And powerful dreams can become, in their own terms, suggest suggestion or hypnotic pressure. Many persons have been hypnotized by a dream and have therefore come under a very strong influence which may have a serious effect upon them. One of the reasons why dreams may come true is because subconsciously we are making them come true. We are determined in some way to fulfill them or are so strongly influenced by them that this fulfillment becomes an instinctive process in ourselves. Now, in hypnosis, we recognize three distinct levels of influence. We have what may be termed light hypnotic tension. In this state, the individual is able to accept certain suggestions. He is aware that he accepts these suggestions. But he is also aware that his resistance to suggestion has been lowered. He is in a sympathy with the suggestion. He is a state in, in a state in which his own attitudes do not rise belligerently against the suggestion. If you say to an individual in his conscious state, you can control your temper, he will explain to you at great length why he cannot why it wouldn't be fair for him to if he could. And that the whole problem lies in the fact that other people badly treat him. Under hypnotic tension, even under light hypnosis, the individual simply forgets all of these secondary considerations. They simply cease to exist. He has only a complete receptivity. If the operator tells him that he can overcome a bad disposition, chap says, well, I guess I can. It never occurs to him any longer to say, no, I can't. 
this objection function has been blocked. And this would be a happy world indeed if more objection functions were continuously blocked. But not really, because these in turn have to be explored. But lots of folks would be happier now and immediately if there were less were objectors in the world. The second degree of hypnosis involves a further intensification of it. The subject loses orientation with things around him. If in the midst of treatment the doorbell rings, he will not be disturbed, whereas in light hypnosis he probably will be. If things occur which might, under some situation, draw him back again into his own consciousness, these occurrences will not have this effect if he has reached a middle or moderate degree of hypnotic tension. He is sort of alone now in space, no one around but the operator. He is conscious. He knows that he is being given suggestions. He hears the words, and he accepts them without resistance. When he later is brought out of the hypnotic state, he will remember everything that occurred. He will remember the words, just as he would remember them in the lightest or first degree of hypnosis. So the uh, first degree and second degree have this point in common that the entire procedure is consciously remembered afterwards. In many ways, the light or moderate hypnosis has therapeutic advantages. It helps the person to have confidence in the operator. The person knows how he is being suggested. He knows what is happening. No suggestion can be slipped over on him. He is not afraid that he will be told to do something which will be contrary to some basic principle or conviction or belief that he has. On the other hand, because he is still self-conscious, the degree of penetration of suggestion is not as great as it is in the third degree or, for practical purposes, the deep hypnotic trance. In this condition, the patient is no longer consciously aware of himself, nor of the operator, nor of any circumstance occurring around him. Yet in this condition, he may and often does develop an independent awareness, which may again be somewhat likened to sleep awareness. The patient, for example, or the subject, under deep hypnosis, hypnosis, with no conscious memory of himself or of the operator, can develop a living personality of his own, which exists only during hypnosis, as sometimes it occurs only during sleep. Regression also shows that the person in this condition can move back to his own life experience, identifying himself only with the immediate occurrences. In this state, memory is blocked. And the blocking of memory is very interesting. For memory is not only the remembering of the past, but the remembering of environment and the familiar now. Therefore, the blocking of memory uh, places the individual entirely outside of the time sequence factor. His experience consists of a sequence of independent frames, like the single frames of a motion picture film. He moves from frame to frame, and the one he is in exists. The one he moves from has no existence. The one he moves to is not anticipated. This timelessness, which is part of your deep hypnosis factor, 
has even religious and spiritual implications. By means of it, man is able to actually pass through a series of immediate experiences of now. But the being which experiences this now does not record the experience. Here we have perhaps a key to certain mystical experiences of individuals who do on occasion break through the time-place barriers and uh, come into immediate contact with eternal situations. It is quite possible that the study of this field of immediacy in third-degree hypnosis will have validity in both the scientific and philosophical world in years to come. The person having now developed an independent existence may and can live in this existence in a reasonably complete manner. A person under third degree hypnosis does not have to lie on a couch like a block of marble and certainly does not need to be suspended across two chair backs as was fashionable in the 19th century. Actually, this person can get up, engage in conversation, have a very vivacious and animated time, mix with people, shake hands with them, know them, discuss all kinds of problems with them. And yet this person will not exist or be remembered in any way when the subject is actually brought out of hypnosis. More of special value through regression is that this person can be regressed into elaborate pageants of situations. A case in which a young man in his 20s led a complete symphony orchestra might be a point. In his 50s, under psychological treatment, he was regressed to that great concert in which he was the conductor. For several hours, in fact the full length of the concert, he stood upon an imaginary podium, waved a non-existing baton, and conducted an orchestra, even going so far as to hum with the music, which is an old conductor's trick. He heard this music exactly. He knew exactly the bar that was being played at any time. He also realized about halfway through the concert that the first violinist was a little flat. This caused him no end of anguish. He received the applause of a vast non-existing audience with proper dignity, humility, and exaltation. He lived the whole thing. He was in every way completely re-experienced something long ago. Every sensibility had this awareness. Now supposing we say that this same person was then returned again to a comparatively calm, sleepless state and later awakened with the suggestion not to remember. Under such conditions, uh, he would have no recording in his conscious mind at all that he had experienced or lived through again this symptom. What does this tell us? It tells us that this experience which he relived was always present in him. It was not manufactured out of thin air. It was merely given a means of expression. He was living with that symphony continuously, day and night, in himself. 
it would never cease. If it had ever ceased, even for a moment, he could not restore it. This gives us a new dimension of memory. It proves to us that memory is not merely the record of the past, but contains within its dimensions the power to re-experience the past. And one point we have often made of memory is the blessed fact that we can remember, but we cannot re-experience which has been our common theory. The only reason we cannot re-experience is because we permit our memory to fall under the time-place sequence of suggestion and outlaw the possibility of immediate uh, reconstruction of the emotional impact and experience of an event. This tells us that in our memory, therefore, is the power if we know how to use it, to relive everything that has ever happened to us. Nature does not wish us to relive these experiences. Therefore, has placed a blessed silence on this faculty within our own nature. Yet nature itself occasionally calls upon such things. And here is an interesting point in hypnotic control again. The operator placing the person in this space and inviting the person to re-experience this wonderful concert or whatever it may have been. The operator wasn't present at the concert. No part of this suggestion came from the operator. He was not forcing the man to relive an experience. To do so, he would have had to impart that experience either in words, or in thoughts, or in attitudes, or in some symbol that would stimulate it. This was not necessary. Therefore, the operator did not create the concert in the person's mind. The operator only made possible the release of this situation that already existed. There is one further evidence. Uh, that it is not right or fair to say that the operator forces experiences upon the individual. He frequently permits the individual to experience circumstances of which the operator has no knowledge at all. The same is true in your regression technique. The operator regressing a subject for psychological purposes has no idea what he is going to find. Therefore, he cannot suggest it. Yet if he works upon the patient objectively, he can suggest. We can suggest things sometimes more strongly uh, in uh, a conscious state than we can when the subject is under hypnotic tension. If a person coming to an analyst or psychologist explains his situation, and the psychologist says to him, well, I'll bet that's the result of that difficulty you had in boarding school. The patient, seizing on anything, will say, oh, yes, undoubtedly. Now I remember it clearly. He is immediately fulfilling the analyst's desire. He is also leading himself into a suggestion that it has been planted therefore, can very well be wrong. But if the analyst, <coughs> regressing that person to that experience in boarding school, carries the person through it, causing him to relive it, he may find that nothing of real importance actually occurred at all. Everyone was wrong. It would come out finally in analysis but finally, maybe quite a long time from now. Therefore, the uh, analyst or the hypnotic analyst goes further. He moves the individual back and forth over time span. There may be a dozen possible or probable critical situations that have been dis brought out by ordinary discussion. The analyst drops 
the consciousness of the person under tension into each one of these situations. And suddenly, in the midst of one of them, the patient passes into the mood of the original occurrence. He suffers, he screams, he groans, he is hurt, he is offended. The bottom has dropped out of his world. May have been some little thing that the analyst would never normally have looked for. It was that day his parents took the rabbit away from him. It was that day when some illusion, some dream was destroyed. And there we begin to get down to the basis of the matter. Also, we have no way of measuring, under normal conditions, the nature and detail of this reaction except through the long, confused, consequential meanderings of this reaction through circumstances. By the time an individual has lived with a reaction for 20 years, mixed it into every project of his life, been hurt by it in a dozen different ways, and has been modified in character, until perhaps very little of his original nature is any longer apparent. This person uh, has trouble in trying to clearly isolate the real facts about his own problems. But under this type of hypnotic tension, he can tell exactly what caused the trouble. The operator can find out the peculiar psychic twist of that person's childish personality that made this thing hurt him so profoundly. Why it hurt him, how it hurt him, what he did about it. All these things are relived, and the intensity of the reliving reveals the intensity of the psychic pressure. Sometimes several things have combined to create this pressure. But in almost every instance, reliving of it can bring it out. This reliving, under this type of pressure, is released directly, coherently. It is released in a manner in which it can be quickly used and can perhaps suggest certain psychotherapeutic uh, counter-suggestions or compensatory suggestions, which will help. On the other hand, this reliving of the true experience is not limited actually at all to the hypnotic state. It is there all the time, like the concert. And where the pressure gets too great, it may break through in dream symbolism, without the use of hypnotic suggestion. But when it breaks through in this way, it breaks through symbolically. It breaks through through association or by means of some design, figure, symbol, or device, by a theatrical dramatization of the event with a new cast of characters. It is not brought forth in its original nature. As a result of this difference, it is less available for immediate use. It can be interpreted gradually, but we must plow our way through all possible explanations, perhaps, before we are able to pick the correct one. When an individual has a dream indicating that he has been over-influenced, this is not as helpful as might at first appear. For the probabilities of being over-influenced are universal. And the probabilities that any one individual has been over-influenced is not a probability of one such occurrence, but the almost certainty that he has been over-influenced many times. Which one has caused the damage? It is not even always the first one. It is the one which created a peculiar stress in that person. So now through hypnosis, we get into a peculiar realization 
But there is a strata of human consciousness, a stratum of life, in which everything is continuously experienced. And this continuous experience, even in the struggle to clear it hypnotically, is interesting on a dimensional basis. A person, for instance, can relive one situation and then be progressed to another, and so on, and so on, or regress backwards. And these experiences are only in this frame-like structure because the operator is moving that way, he is moving from one uh, guidepost to another. He does not know what lies between. He can, theoretically, if he wishes to live long enough at it, complete an entire recapitulation of the entire life of the individual. He can take its waking and sleeping phenomena, and he can cause this person to go through the past 30 years exactly as they happen. Every mood, every instinct, every thought, every reflex, but it will take 30 years because he has to relive the whole thing over again. Yet any moment of that 30 years can be pulled out. If it is dropped back, another moment can be pulled out. Also, the flowing of events will indicate that they can be moved backward and forward at will, and all that is required is a focal point. Thus, out of this mystery can be redrawn or recaptured at any moment, any part of it, simply by focalizing on it. This opens a tremendous field of speculation concerning the interior constitution of the human psyche. It gives us much more to think about and work upon than we have ever suspected before. Under the same general theme of hypnosis, we move towards what might be termed the future, the development of the techniques of this subject as they may apply. We know, for example, that in the life of the person today, most of his basic problems are unsolved. He is helped, he is hindered. But always he is inadequate because he does not have conscious control of his own unconscious impulses. He does not know the real reason for the things he does. He does not know why his attitudes break into patterns which sometimes persecute him. He does not know any cause for his likes or dislikes, except perhaps very superficial as secondary reactions to inadequate stimuli. He does not know why he is what he is. He also does not know how he can be what he ought to be. The only way in which the final solution can come is the opening up of the entire interior life of man. The realization that the internal moves the external. That everything that happens to us on the outside of life is the result of pressures from the inside of life. Also, we suspect strongly that what we call the extrasensory perception gamut can also be stimulated by hypnotic suggestion. It is quite conceivable that under hypnosis the individual can be clairvoyant. It is very possible that under hypnosis the individual can discover laws and rules of the greatest value to his own conduct to the advancement of science and knowledge and to the final solution of world problems. He can discover anything that is locked within himself. Also, 
he can be assisted to stimulate the fact other than that which is evident and obvious in the phenomena itself. That there is a temporary influence cannot be denied. But that this influence is other than psychological is now not only denied, but rather clearly disproved. Many ways can be used to check such things, and all checking has as yet proved negative. There seems to be no need for the assumption that hypnosis involves metaphysical elements. It is purely a physical matter, but one which involves elements of our physical nature, which have only been known to us within a comparatively recent period. Once the public has come to recognize that the hypnotist is a physician and not a magician, much good can be accomplished, and individuals with numerous difficulties can hope for help in this direction. Now we know that religious authority is very powerful in our thinking. No one wishes to discount the importance of religious belief. There are religious groups today that are strongly opposed to all hypnotic research. They do not even wish that the subject uh, should be explored. Certainly their members, if they wish to be in good standing, must follow the leadership of the faith to which they belong. But as no faith or no sect dominates public opinion in this country according to the definite provision of the First Amendment to the Constitution and the first section of the Bill of Rights, those of other beliefs not holding this antagonism towards hypnosis have a perfect right also to explore their own convictions and make such discoveries as they feel may be of common benefit. As in the case of anesthesia, the benefits are now becoming so obvious that old opinions are being forced to scientific men who do not like to be regarded as the direct descendants of witch doctors. They feel this is somewhat uh, a compromising of their dignity. We know that hypnosis in various forms and under various names was broadly practiced among ancient peoples, particularly among primitive people. It had a place in the therapy of Greece and Rome and Egypt. But in our living experience, we found a close tie with certain Bhutan practices of the West Indies and the mysterious remedies of the American Indian medicine man. Such affin affinities and affiliations were not particularly intriguing uh, to the American Medical Association. We sort of felt that it should be regarded as having outgrown such old beliefs. In time, however, private practitioners stepped into the field. They began to contemplate the matter much as Paracelsus had done, with a new dedication, namely a dedication to the need of the sick. But this had come before all prejudice and we should decline or reject nothing which could be actually useful. Because of the prevailing popular prejudice, 
One of the earliest types of investigation in the modern field of hypnotism was to determine whether there was any truth in the idea that some mysterious fluid, essence, energy, substance, passed from the hypnotist to the subject. Was there some strange bond set up by means of which the completeness of personal integration was injured? Did the hypnotist, so to say, uh, put some part of himself into his subject where it remains to affect freedom of thought or freedom of action or independent psychological existence? All research to the present time has indicated that this is not true. That there is no uh, connection established between the hypnotist and his subject. Regard hypnotic technique as a kind of magic. It involved all of the romantic overtones that have been preserved to us in the story of Sandali. The hypnotist was a satanic person, weird, strange, and actually a sorcerer out of the literature of the Middle Ages. His methods, being poorly understood, were richly misunderstood. And the popular mind came to the conclusion that a visit to a hypnotist was very much like a pact with Satan. In some way, this system of treatment interfered with the normal function of the human soul. It was a dastardly contrivance, giving to the operator tremendous power and control over the life of every innocent trilby that came along. This attitude was not improved by the rise in the 19th century of stage hypnotism in which the entire field fell into the lap of entertainment. This meant every possible means of exploiting and dramatizing the subject with little regard for its dignity or its basic meaning. Gradually, however, interest in the facts revealed through the techniques of hypnotism increased and probably developed most rapidly after the rise of our interest in the psychological life of the individual. When we began to study the internal subjective functions of the human mind, it opened the door for the further estimation of the basic problem of hypnosis. First of all, there was much rubbish to be cleared away. Much of this rubbish, of course, had no more sound foundation than public opinion. But there was also a tie with antiquity that proved rather embarrassing. Modern research in the field of hypnotism began with the researches of Anton Mesmer in the 18th century. While these researches in many ways produced positive results, they were open to criticism and suspicion, perhaps <coughs> at least in part because of the rather flamboyant way in which Mesmer uh, practiced the art and the 
peculiarly bombastic style in which he wrote on the subject. Even a progressive man, philosopher and scholar, Benjamin Franklin, after examining and attending some of Metzmar's seances, declined to affirm his belief in the validity of the phenomena. Scientific bodies were particularly unhappy about the whole subject. But it must be admitted that are not doctors and scientists became interested to cause a heavy controversy which locked the subject for nearly 75 years. It was in the middle of the 19th century that an English physician began to experiment with the theories of Metzmer and applied them cautiously but successfully to a number of cases that came under his personal care. He changed the name from mesmerism to hypnotism and again brought down the wrath of the gods. In this case, the gods consisted not only of scientific bodies, but of religious groups and public opinion itself. It is quite probable that public opinion was rather heavily influenced by certain clergymen who thundered against hypnotism from their pulpits in the same way that they had also thundered against anesthesia. The popular mind, however, came to, uh, to change, and in most instances, such changes increase public comfort and safety. Hypnosis as a field began in a comparatively simple area, namely the possibility of communicating certain attitudes, certain instructions, certain suggestions from one person to another in a manner more favorable than homely advice or old-fashioned admonition. As the time passed, however, it became evident that the whole concept of hypnosis rested upon a pattern of universal laws. That these laws not only invited one use, but opened a broad field of research, a field capable of making a variety of contributions at different times and under different circumstances. Thus, the concept, the basic hypothesis underlying the fact of hypnosis gives us many inducements to explore neglected areas of mental phenomena. There is even a, a suggestion, a hope, that out of the byproduct of hypnotic research, there may come an entirely new concept of therapy, a concept that which will not involve hypnosis as we know it today, or at least only in small parts, but which will drive home to us one of the most important truths in the entire world of therapy namely the possibility that man can become his own physician. That the individual possesses means for restoring health on many levels by the use of energies resting within himself rather than by the use of comparatively violent medication and drugs. So if hypnosis leads us 
into a field of drugless therapy, we may do the body a great favor. For under our present system, 